Welcome to the inaugural Wisconsin Lawyers Chapters Conference. Um, thank you all very much for being here with us today. Uh, my name is Rob Driscoll. I am the president of the Milwaukee Lawyers Chapter, uh, which along with the Madison Lawyers Chapter is the, the host of today's uh, conference. Um, for those of you who are maybe new to the Federalist Society, just a bit of background about the organization. It's a nationwide organization which boasts of more than 60,000 members in its lawyers division and has chapters in 80 different cities across the country. Uh, the student division has 10,000 members and chapters at all, maybe or most, of the ABA accredited law schools, plus chapters at other organizations, including some undergraduate uh, institutions <coughs> across the country as well. The society was first founded in 1982. Uh, the, the purpose, then as now, was to promote legal debate across all sectors of the legal prof profession and to promote principles such as the separation of powers and the proper role of the judiciary in a free society. Um, specifically, as regards to the judiciary, that is the, emphatically the province and duty of the judiciary to say what the law is and not what it should be. The society, however, is nonpartisan. It takes no positions on matters of public policy. It does not advocate for positions in court, and it does not endorse candidates for elected office. The varied views that you'll hear today from our tremendous group of panelists are those uh, are their, their own and not those of the society. A conference like this doesn't come together very easily and not without a lot of volunteer hours uh, being put into it. And I think those volunteers deserve a little bit of recognition <coughs> as we start. Um, both chapters had a number of members who uh, volunteered right at the beginning to serve on a couple of committees, and I wanted to recognize those individuals. Um, so let me read their names, and then we can uh, finish off with a round of applause. They were Justice Rebecca Bradley, Judge Brian Hagedorn, Professor Ryan Owens, Daniel Sir, Tim Lundquist, Carl Dolan, and Corden Fish. So if you can uh, join me in uh, thanking them with a round of applause. Now, there are two other individuals that we need to thank as well, um, and they come from the national organization, uh, Lisa Azell and Kate Fugate. Um, Lisa, you've seen right here, she's right here in the front, and Kate has been working the table. Um, without them, this absolutely would not have happened. Uh, they did just the lion's share of the detailed work on this uh, and brought their experience and, most importantly, their patience um, with us. So if we could thank them as well, I'd appreciate it. <laughs> In September 1859, a rising lawyer from Illinois made his way to Milwaukee. The occasion was uh, an agricultural fair put on by the Wisconsin State Agricultural Society at a site in Milwaukee that is incidentally now owned by, Milwaukee, or by Marquette University. Just over a year away from being elected president, Abraham Lincoln used his time in front of that group to discuss uh, such scintillating topics as the importance of developing a steam plow to aid in the produ production of uh, agriculture in the country, and also his views as to the relationship between capital and labor, uh, a timely topic given that the Communist Manifesto had been published just 10 years before. Um, his talk is really not well known to history. It's certainly not a masterpiece of oratory like the Gettysburg Address or the Second Inaugural. But his opening paragraph is what interests me the most. Um, he, he quietly expressed a thought in that opening paragraph that's all the more interesting because of its proximity to the Civil War, which, again, was just over a year away. Speaking of the fair, he said, they bring us together and thereby make us better acquainted and better friends than we otherwise would be. They make more pleasant and more strong and more durable the bond of social and political union among us. About a year before that, Lincoln had expressed a similar sentiment at a Fourth of July celebration, finding those celebrations to be a common tie among citizens, taking us back to the Declaration of Independence, what he would later call in the same talk an electric cord. He said, we go from these meetings in better humor with ourselves, we feel more attached the one to the other, and more firmly bound to the country we inhabit. In every way, we are better men in the age and race and country in which we live for these celebrations. Both of these insights were characteristically Lincolnian, expressing abstract truths in plain terms using unremarkable examples. This conference and the others across the country like it are descendants of those gatherings that Lincoln found so important 160 years ago. 
They are opportunities to gauge in the open and spirited debate and the exchange of ideas that is both a benefit of a free society and its necessary precondition. For without that exchange, we are not only in a worse humor with one another, but we deprive ourselves of the opportunity to better understand both our own principles and those of our fellow citizens. As Lincoln's 19th century contemporary Alexis de Tocqueville wrote, when the right of every citizen to share in the government of society is acknowledged, everyone must be presumed to be able to choose between the various opinions of his contemporaries and to appreciate the different facts from which those inferences may be drawn. I differ, the, differ with the Frenchman on one point only, that it is not only a presumption, but a duty. And I'm glad that we are able to fulfill our duty here today. So again, welcome to the inaugural conference. Thank you for your participation. And I hope you leave here too with the bonds of social and political union at least a little bit stronger for having attended. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, very, very uh, good introduction, and thanks everyone for coming out on this uh, rainy Friday uh, to, to see the, uh, to see this conference. Uh, the first panel uh, today is uh, First Amendment controversies, free speech, and religious liberty, where we have uh, four distinguished speakers. They're each going to speak uh, for 12 minutes on a topic. Uh, related to to the subject, um, then uh, then they they will have uh, each panelist will have an opportunity to kind of address the the remarks given by uh, their fellow panelists. I will then take uh, moderator privilege to ask the fir first question or two, and then we'll open it up f uh, for the audience. Uh, this is my first time moderating a, a panel. I've, I've been on, on panels a, a, a good bit for both federal society and otherwise. It's kind of two ways. You can introduce the speakers. You can either do all of their bios first, or you can do the bio, then they speak. And, and I, I'm going to do the second, because I, sometimes you, you hear four bios in, in a row at the beginning, and you kind of your mind drifts away. So I'm going to give each speaker's bio, and then they'll speak. And then I'll give the next speaker's bio, and they'll speak. So uh, first uh, uh, speaker today uh, is Professor Howard Schorber, uh, who is a professor at UW here in Madison within the political science department. Professor Schorber is also a core faculty member of the UW Legal Studies program. From um, 2011 to 2013, he was visiting professor as at Nazabayev, did I say that correct? Close enough. Uh, University in Kazakhstan. In 2012, he was the Australian Fulbright Distinguished Chair uh, in, uh, in American politics. He, was, he has authored several books, including Amer uh, Democracy and Authenticity, The Language of Liberal Constitutionalism, The Creation of American Common Law, Speech, Conduct, and the First Amendment. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. So I'm, I'm really touched because in one of the books that was just mentioned, I actually have a section where I discuss Abraham Lincoln's attachment to steam-powered farm implements. And this is the first time I've ever <laughs> heard that reference by anyone else. And so I just thank you. It's, <laughs> it's actually quite an important theme. Uh, Lincoln believed that technology particularly railroads and telegraphs, would bring us together uh, as a single nation by allowing strangers and people who live at great distance to communicate. Uh, in fact, Jefferson, much earlier, went through a similar evolu an evolution in his own thinking, in which he largely abandoned his attachment to the idea of the yeoman farmer uh, and the need for local community in his belief that the growth of early, this is about 1820 or so, railroad technology would make us all one people with one conversation. Today, of course, the internet binds us together into a single group of shared values. Uh, and it, <laughs> it all worked, is my point. All right. Um, each of us has a somewhat different role on this panel. Mine is to belabor the obvious. I'm hoping to be able to belabor some obvious points in at least slightly interesting ways. Uh, I'm keenly aware uh, that with this audience, the last thing I need to do is, is recite basic elements of constitutional law or precedents. So I'll speak in very broad strokes. Um, if, if I say something that seems to require defense or explication, I'm more than happy uh, to provide that afterwards. I want to talk about the way in which both our broad understanding of free speech and our broad understanding of religious liberty has gone through a, 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 quite a sharp change. Um, 
And periodizing this change is a little bit difficult because they're not perfectly coterminous. But in both cases, there's a very clear sort of early period and more modern period. And I want to suggest, this is the potentially provocative part, that the, con the more difficult controversies that we face today arise in part because we haven't worked out uh, what this new regime, this new jurisprudential regime looks like. Before I, I, I dig into that, uh, um, a couple of very quick observations that we really need to keep in mind when we have discussions like these. One is that when we talk about constitutional issues, we have a tendency to forget that anything else exists. Well, not we, some of us. Okay, I do, all right? Uh, that is confronted by a First Amendment question, I think only about the First Amendment. But of course, there are whole complex bodies of law, federal and state law, that also have to do with how rights can be exercised and defined in actual practice. And I'll give you one obvious example. Uh, in teaching First Amendment, or talking publicly about First Amendment, one of the classic things to say is that provocative speech is protected. And you can start talking about heckler's vetoes, and how no matter how provocative an idea is, you know, we are obliged to treat it with toleration and so on. And as a constitutional statement, that's absolutely fine. It's also true, however, that provocative speech can be a defense to murder. Um, so you have a constitutional right to engage in speech, but someone else may have a legal right to kill you for it. That's a somewhat nuanced right that I just described right there. Uh, under an appropriate circumstance, provocative speech may constitute the intentional infliction of outrageous emotional distress for which you can be sued and large amounts of your wealth and property can be taken away. So again, sure, it's constitutionally protected. That doesn't mean you have immunity from all the legal consequences. Um, I really like that ringtone. <laughs> There'll be no consequence Later. for that. Uh, secondly, and, and this is perhaps the most obvious, you know, talk about belaboring the obvious, this is really getting carried away, but in the context of free speech and religious liberty in particular, it's sometimes worth reminding ourselves that calling something uh, a right uh, uh, includes the recognition that no rights are absolute or simply defined. Uh, and I don't mean this, this part to be provocative at all, um, any number of simple examples, no one has ever suggested that the right of free speech protects my right to say, give me your wallet or I'll shoot you. Uh, nor to engage in blackmail, nor re revealing the state secrets, nor about a thousand other categories that we all know of areas in which engaging in speech uh, is not a protected activity, right? And the same goes for religious liberty. Um, long ago, there was an attempt by someone to argue that my religion, which I've only recently discovered, prohibits me from paying taxes. And the court said, nah, we're not gonna buy that. Nor human sacrifice, nor any number of other things. Right? Third observation, uh, and again, I, I almost feel I should apologize for how obvious this is, although I think in a moment it'll become a little bit clear that it's less obvious. Um, that which is not, there's a difference constitutionally between what is obliged and what is permitted. And the fact that the Constitution doesn't require something uh, does not mean that it requires its opposite, uh, and does not mean that it does not permit that which is not required. All right, with all that wildly uh, elementary background. So the old regime, as I'm describing it, uh, of religious liberty constitutional doctrine, which starts in the 1940s and goes roughly to, just, let's say, the 1980s, was based on a premise that religion is a special case, specially dangerous and specially valuable. And therefore, religion must be shielded from politics and from the state, and the state and politics must be shielded from the effects of religion. And in the context of both free exercise and establishment, this largely played out in terms of the question of incidentals, incidental benefits and incidental burdens. And in those days, the courts were very careful to avoid incidental benefits and incidental burdens. Um, you can think of lots of instances uh, uh, of this sort of thing, but the, the most <coughs> obvious ones. So the free exercise clause was understood to prohibit or at least to impose a strict scrutiny standard of review on incidental burdens on free exercise. That's Sherbert. Uh, if you look at cases leading up to Lemon, uh, there's all this discussion about things like entanglement and the concern about incidental benefits. And the idea was that unlike in other areas of constitutional jurisprudence, in the areas of, because religion was such a special case, there would be extra efforts made both to shield the machinery of the state, as it was called in Grendel's Den versus Larkin, uh, from use by religious entities, and conversely, to protect religious practices, religious institutions, from intrusion by the state. 
So for example, just again, I know this is elementary, but recall that part of the issue uh, of entanglement in Lemon was that in order to allow the funding to go forward as had been described without running afoul of, afoul of establishment clause considerations, it would be necessary for government agencies to exercise scrutiny over the activities of a religious school, and it was the necessity of that scrutiny not the, not the fact of the benefit, but the, the, the necessity of that close interaction between government agents uh, and a religious school that caused the court to say this would be unacceptable. That was the whole entanglement idea. In that period, where questions were asked, having to do with religious liberty, the intellectual tension at work was the tension between the requirements of the Establishment Clause and the requirements of the Free Exercise Clause. And the kinds of questions that were asked were, if we allow too much in the way of special prerogatives for religious practice, do we risk giving the state's imprimatur to an establishment? If we allow too much in the way of the state establishing or acting toward establishment of religion, does that have the effect of interfering with the free exercise of religion by those who are from a different, or adherence to a different community? And those were the, 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 that intellectual tension was the terrain on which the debate was carried out. On the speech side, the old regime uh, was essentially one of categories, increasingly sharply drawn categories, in particular sharp distinctions between protected and unprotected speech, very formally defined, uh, and sharp distinctions between speech and expressive conduct. So the rules for regulation of expressive conduct were very, very different from the rules regarding expression of speech per se. Uh, if a law was not directed at the expressive expression itself, but only at the conduct elements, uh, then it was likely to be fine. And that's O'Brien, uh, zoning laws, right, any number of other cases in which expressive conduct was at issue. And within those two terrains of intellectual debate, free speech and freedom of religion did not very often overlap. I know, for example, that uh, um, uh, Professor Eisenberg will refer to Barnett, right? That's one of the cases you'll talk about. Uh, Barnett is a famous case uh, involving a Jehovah's Witness, a student who was a Jehovah's Witness who objected to being required to recite the Pledge of Allegiance. I won't try and say any more because I'm sure you want to profile in some particular way. The only point I wanted to mention is that that case was not a religion case. Uh, the, the student's objections were religious. But it was decided solely on free exercise, uh, excuse me, on free speech grounds, and particularly on the on the idea that compelled speech is not permissible. Um, the words under God were not part of the pledge in those days, and the fact that the students' objections were grounded in his religion was not part of the analysis. I mentioned that at the moment. Again, this issue will be dealt with in much more depth in a moment. My interest in mentioning that is just to point out that in this earlier period. The terrain of debate about religious freedom and the terrain of debate about free expression were largely, not entirely, but largely separate. What about the more modern era in both cases? Well, on the religion side, the giant change is that religion is simply treated much less as a special case, less protected uh, and less to be protected against in, bo in, in both directions. Of course, on the free exercise side, the most famous case is Smith, Justice Scalia's argument, or not argument, excuse me, uh, ruling in his majority opinion that there is no constitutional obligation to grant exceptions to generally applicable law for religious practice and no heightened level of scrutiny that is triggered by such an incidental burden. As Justice Scalia said in that opinion, this does naturally imply that in a democracy, majority religions will receive more accommodation than minority religions, but that, he said, is the inescapable cost of living in a democracy. Right, so taking, drastically reducing the extent to which we think of freedom of religious practice as something shielded against democratic politics, and quite explicitly, in Scalia's words, making it part of a legitimate subject of democratic politics. It was a very controversial opinion. Uh, I, I believe it's controversial to this day. I think it's a fair statement. Uh, uh, but certainly as an indicator of a shift in the treatment of religion as a special topic, its implications were stark and remain so. Uh, Agostini, in which the, the, the court abandoned the whole entanglement idea, uh, simply saying that there's no need for the state to ensure that its accommodation of free exercise does not slip into establishment. And since there's no need to ensure that uh, against that danger through surveillance, there's no need for entanglement. The specific context had to do with teachers, but more generally that we will not be concerned about a secondary consequence of entanglement between the state and religion. There's no need for such a sharp division. Uh, and Zelman, and of course there are lots of other cases, but right, indirect benefits uh, uh, in the form of public support don't raise uh, establishment clause questions. 
Not that they raise the questions, we'll decide them differently. Don't raise them at all. An intervening private choice means there is no constitutional issue. Now, I am not trying to argue that any of these are good or bad outcomes or better or worse than the rules that came before, but they're different. They're radically different and the, intellectually. And the radical change is that religion is simply not as, as much a special case as it was before. It's much more treated as, is that how much time I have left? You have a minute left. A minute. Fortunately, I can talk very fast. Uh, OK, I'll try. On the speech side, uh, the, the sharp division of categories has been blurred and broken down in, in, in multiple ways. Uh, we can think about RAV, for example, the idea that there is no sharp distinction between protected and unprotected categories of speech uh, if, there's an if there's a potential issue of viewpoint discrimination. Uh, the idea, perhaps shown most clearly in campaign finance context, that expressive conduct and pure speech are not different. They're, they will be treated synonymously. Uh, obviously, the, un, un, under the O'Brien sort of understanding, a rule that applies to all campaign finance activities of a certain type is not aimed at the content of the expression, it's aimed at the conduct of spending money, but that distinction has been abandoned uh, in that context and in many others. So uh, you can think of the negative association cases like Dale, uh, which again, previously have been decided under a regime that said association is a form of expressive conduct, it's only very narrowly protected, it has to be a very particular kind of association with very particular characteristics. Uh, in Dale, the court said, no, no, that's not true. Uh, association is expressive conduct, which is just like speech, and it all becomes a form of compelled speech. I'm simplifying dramatically, but I have 30 seconds left. Uh. So <laughs> what I want to suggest, <laughs> uh, and I could have suggested better if I had just five more minutes, <laughs> is that in the current terrain, the reason for this conference, for this discussion, is that we do now have direct tension between principles of free speech uh, and religious practice in ways that did not, that, that we were sort of shielded from under an earlier intellectual regime. And we have not yet worked out the boundaries of our new categories. If, all, if expressive conduct is exactly the same as speech, is all expressive conduct equivalently the same as speech? Right? Or is some expressive conduct more expressive than others? Now that we've abandoned the sharp distinction between laws directed at expression and laws directed at conduct, we're going to need some other way to distinguish cases. Um, if religious exemptions are not required but are permitted and left to the democratic process, is there any point at which granting too much accommodation to majority religions while denying them to minority religions raises some sort of equal protection issue independent of the older doctrines that we had about religious accommodation? Right? And, and, and you can, I think you will see as you listen to the following discussions how many of the conundra uh, with which we find ourselves faced today are articulable in this new, or relatively new, my lifetime anyway, intellectual framework of thinking about religious liberty and free speech in ways they would not have been prior that's, to the 1980s. And that's, I'm done. That's a, great, that's a great segue to the next, that was it. That next, was, next that was uh, talk. Um, thank you so much, Professor, for, the, for those remarks. Uh, our next remarks will be for, from Professor Rick Essenberg, who is the founder, president, and general counsel of the Wisconsin Institute of Law and Liberty, a law and public policy organization headquartered in Milwaukee. Formerly on the faculty of Marquette University Law School, his scholarship has appeared in publications such as the Harvard Law Review, Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy, Wake Forest Law Review, and William and Mary uh, Bill of Rights Journal. Thank you, Professor. Uh, well, thank you. Um, uh, this is an auspicious occasion, the inaugural conference of the uh, Wisconsin chapters of the Federalist Society. Um, I've always been particularly heartened by uh, the rejuvenation of the Madison chapter of the Federalist Society. Uh, um, a couple of years ago, when you all got started again, uh, uh, I think I spoke at uh, one of your early luncheons, and it was at the Madison Club, and I came here to Dane County, and the room was full. The room was full of lawyers who were willing to come to a Federalist Society event. And I remember making a joke that I felt like like Abraham might have felt had he been able to tell the Lord that there were 10 righteous men in Sodom. <laughs> um, and, I include, uh, and I include in, the, uh, in this category of, of, of righteous men and women uh, uh, those people uh, like my, uh, my friend and uh, occasional nemesis, Lester Pines, uh, 
um, who are uh, uh, who I, who are at every Federalist Society, a major Federalist Society event, and are willing to engage in in a civil discourse um, about issues on which we profoundly disagree. And I think the willingness of of, of folks to do that uh, is is to be commended, and that is a clever segue, uh, very clever, I think, uh, into, my, uh, into my remarks today. Now, I, I, uh, I ran into Justice Bradley uh, before we started today, and she said, well, you know, are, are you going to talk about, you know, something before the court? Uh, because if you are, then, you know, Justice Kelly and I will have to excuse ourselves. And, and I said, well, no, I'm not going to talk about cases of the law or anything like that. Uh, this is what we call in the opinion business a thumb sucker. Uh, and that is, I, I want to talk about um, um, what I think are some broad themes that touch upon our consideration of both freedom of speech and religious liberty. And the core principle, the core case that I want to turn to, however, uh, to have that conversation is West Virginia State Board of Education versus Barnett. Now, you'll remember that case from. Sorry. <clears throat> yeah, it is amazing. Uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, you'll remember that case, the, the West Virginia Board of Education in January of 1942 uh, passed a requirement that school children must recite the Pledge of Allegiance. They must be made to say it. Now, from a distance of 76 years, we can think of this as sort of, you know, uh, xenophobic, faux patriotic overreaching. But think, but think of what was happening at the time. Right? This law was passed in the wake of Pearl Harbor. The outcome of the Second World War was far from assured. We were in the process of losing the Philippines and experiencing the Bataan Death March. And it was thought that it was essential to national survival to inculcate in school children a sense of national unity and purpose that would be required for the sacrifices that the coming years would require. But yet, the United States Supreme Court said that West Virginia had gone too far, that these students could not be compelled, they could not be made to say something that they did not believe. And in one of the most stirring passages in our constitutional jurisprudence, Justice Jackson wrote, if there is any fixed star in our constitutional constellation, it is that no official, high or petty, can prescribe what shall be orthodox in politics, nationalism, religion, or other matters of opinion, or force citizens to confess by word or act their faith therein. Now, you know, people have nibbled around the edges of what Justice Jackson said. They've questioned whether that was really empirically accurate or not. And, and there certainly are exceptions to everything. I agree with uh, Professor Schraber that uh, you know, rights are not uh, absolute. But the fact of the matter is, is that as a legal, as a doctrinal matter, we have extended extraordinary protection to freedom of speech and religious liberty. Extraordinary even in comparison to that afforded by other Western democracies where people can be prosecuted, they can get in trouble for saying the wrong thing, simply for saying the wrong thing. And I, I believe that this robust protection is rooted not only in a confidence in the marketplace of ideas, that if we permit uh, free exchange, we ex permit free ex speech, if we uh, permit people to follow their religious lights, I'm not alighting the doctrinal distinction between you know, freedom of speech and, and, and freedom of religion, but I, but I, but I want to talk about some underlying concepts. Uh, it certainly is rooted in that. It's rooted in uh, Justice Brandeis's famous formulation in 
Whitney versus California, where he said if there is still time to correct error through education, uh, through speech, uh, that more speech rather than enforced silence is uh, the remedy. But it's not only rooted in that. It's also rooted, I think, in a form of epistemic humility about the ability of any institution or any majority to determine what is right or what is wrong, and the desirability and the possibility of imposing that determination upon any one uh, of us, that, uh, that to do that uh, is, is not only futile, um, but dangerous. Uh, that it will lead to a, uh, a war of all against all. And in another famous phrase of Justice Jackson, uh, the unity that we achieve will be the unity of the graveyard. And so uh, this has been you know, part of our constitutional DNA, um, but, 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 we, but it's been hard, and we've never been consistent about it. Uh, there's always been an evil that uh, we sought to eradicate. I mean, it used to be communism, right? It used to be people who dissented in the time of war, and this led to bad decisions, I think. United States versus Schenck, Dennis versus United States in the, in the late, um, late 50s. So, so, so it's not an uncheckered commitment or not a uh, you know, commitment that we've always followed con consistently, but it has been a commitment, and I think it's still the case that at least when we're talking about things which are clearly expressive conduct, um, that the courts have been uh, relatively staunch in protecting these things. Uh, I, I think recently of uh, the case versus Mattel versus of Mattel versus Tam, right? And this was a case where where the issue before the court was. Can you use the, the disparagement clause of the Lanham Act, which says that you know you can't a trademark can't disparage people or groups of people, and uh, and the, the question was whether or not uh, that clause could be used to deny the trademark uh, to an Asian rock band that decided that they were going to sort of take ownership of a racial slur and call themselves the Slants, and the court ruled unanimously that it would be unconstitutional to deny them registration under the Lanham Act. Now, they didn't agree on a rationale. There were four justices. Uh, uh, Justice Alito wrote for a group of four that said that even if you consider this commercial speech, that preventing offensive language is not a legitimate state purpose. And then there was Justice Kennedy, who wrote for another group, and he said that, uh, that this constitutes viewpoint discrimination and cannot stand. And so I think that um, our, our current court is still very, very strong on First Amendment issues. Um, but um, the other day uh, in Green Bay, we hosted an event, and our speaker was David French. And lo and behold, David was making the same points about Burnett that I intended to make today, but unfortunately, none of, fortunately for me, none of you heard him. Um, he did it better. Uh, but one of the questions he asked that hadn't occurred to me, and I'm not gonna ask this question and ask you to raise your hands for fear that uh, the results will contradict the point that I'm trying to make, but um, the, he, he said that notwithstanding the fact that the First Amendment generally wins, do you feel today that you are more free to speak your mind than you were 10 years ago? And this group of people uh, up in Green Bay overwhelmingly raised their hands and they said, no, no, we're not. And why is that? It's not because of the law. And the, the point that David was trying to make is that uh, we don't have, it's not clear that we have a cultural appreciation for robust protection of freedom of speech. We don't have it on the left, and I don't think we have it on the right. Now, you know, we, we see things like, uh, you know, we talk, you know, the, the obvious thing now is to sort of pivot towards, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the controversies on campus about safe places and things like that, and that certainly is part of the conversation. But we also see it in the corporate world. 
where uh, there are certain points of view, certain uh, types of expression that are thought not only to be wrong, but so wrong that they must be subject to uh, what is now a familiar ritual of public shaming and dissociation. Right? And we see this periodically when somebody says something uh, which often uh, uh, in, incorrectly um, is, is, is thought to be outside the bounds of civil uh, uh, discourse because it is uh, insufficiently appreciative of diversity and exclusivity, inclusivity. Uh, but we also see it, in, and I've, I've noticed, in, and I am, I actually am a religious reader of the New York Times. Professor, one, one minute. One minute. And, uh, and, and we see people, academics like Ulrich Bader and Professor Park from UCLA saying things like the ACLU should rethink this First Amendment stuff. And that in fact, and Bader wrote, and this is not an unfair characterization of his piece in the Times, that censorship is free speech. That the way that we uh, advance freedom of speech for uh, uh, minorities is to censor speech, which is thought to get in the way of that. Uh, so if Ronald Reagan said that freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction, I think it's appropriate for us to be, uh, to be concerned about this. And I think that there are two cases in the current term of the court, uh, the Masterpiece uh, Baker's case and the, Colorado, uh, the California case regarding uh, requirements that certain information be provided at crisis pregnancy centers that raise uh, many of these issues. Now, I don't have time to talk about it, but I wasn't going to talk I about will. it because Jordan Lawrence is going to talk about it, and he's worked on them, and he knows a lot more about them than I do. But I would suggest one thing as I uh, le uh, end here is that I think to a substantial c a case, these cases which are said to be about discrimination and consumer protection are really about sending a message that certain points of view are impermissible that some official, both high and petty, is attempting to dictate what is orthodox. And, uh, and the question is, uh, are we going to stand up like Justice Jackson did in Barnett at a time of grave national peril, or will we let the exigencies of the moment uh, underwrite our commitment to freedom of speech and freedom of conscience? Thank you, Professor. Uh, next, we're going to hear from Lester Pines. He's a, a senior partner uh, at a law firm that bears his name here in Madison, uh, a fellow of the American College of Trial Lawyers. He is a respected civil and criminal litigator and appellate advocate. In his over 40 years of practice, he has appeared in trial and appellate courts throughout Wisconsin and at the federal level. He was recently honored by the publica publication Best Lawyers in America as Madison's Lawyer of the Year in Criminal Defense White Collar. Thank you, Lester. Uh, thank you for that introduction. Um, I wanted to share one thing for you, with you, uh, about my resume. I, I am a senior partner at Pines Bach a couple of years ago. I did a deposition of a senior partner at a uh, law firm in Pittsburgh, and I said to him, what does that mean, senior partner? He said, it means you have a lot of gray hair. I said, well, I guess I can't qualify then because I don't have any hair. Uh, uh, my initials are uh, LP. I'm not here as liberal panelist. <laughs> we kind of are, though. <laughs> uh, the, the, the interesting thing about the panel uh, is that uh, we, we had one conference call that generally talk about uh, generally organized the topics that we were going to address, but none of us actually shared with the other what it was that we were specifically going to address. Although I had said I wanted to talk about the concept of sincerely held religious beliefs. Uh, but I want to expand on what I want to address to talk about generally how I perceive the courts within the context of the culture and the court's interaction with the culture um, and how that is uh, somewhat uh, problematic uh, 
in the way that free speech and religious liberty issues are addressed. Uh, so let me take a step back uh, and, and, and just give a little overview of what I think is happening culturally. Uh, and what in my lifetime has been happening at a very rapid rate. Um, and that is, and I was born in 1950, I know it's hard to believe, uh, but I was born in 1950, so I came of age in the 60s, I've been practicing law since the early 70s, and I can talk about the enormous cultural change that has happened in my lifetime. When I was a young boy, who I grew up in a traditional family where my mother was a homemaker, my father worked and supported the family, uh, and the idea of my mother going to work was anathema. My, my father would never have uh, ever th considered my mother going to work. It was a very traditional family structure, and I've seen that change dramatically. I've seen the movement for women's rights have an enormous impact uh, on society. When I grew up in, I grew up in St. Louis, I didn't even know how segregated St. Louis was. Uh, and I, but I've seen how, uh, you know, de jure segregation was eliminated. How that has been a rapid change. How the way we treat Down syndrome people, who when I was a child were institutionalized. How that has changed. How, uh, uh, the, the, the number of religious minorities that are part of our culture, particularly since the uh, uh, immigration law changes in 1965, has really been remarkable. Not to mention the number of different kinds of ethnic restaurants that exist that didn't exist before. For example, when I came to Madison in 1968, there were two Chinese restaurants here. One of them served white bread. Uh, so, this is just a little, uh, uh, just a little picture of what's gone on in the last, in my case, almost 70 years. There's been dramatic cultural change. Uh, there's been dramatic change with regard to sexual mores. There's been dramatic change with regard to uh, the acceptance of gay, lesbian, and transgendered people. All of those things are in the mix of the culture. And the conflicts that arise in the area of free speech and religious liberty, I believe, derive from the dominant culture trying to adjust or to not adjust to the cultural changes that have happened and that will inexorably continue to happen. And that's the lens with it, that's the lens that I think we need to view the, the the cases that come up. Now I'm not a scholar, I'm a practitioner. So I don't have the same uh, uh, I, I'm not as versatile in talking about Supreme Court cases and doctrine. But I see I I, I see the potential effects of them. Uh, and I see in recent cases that they are in reaction in part to cultural change. Now, if we look, for example, uh, at the Hobby Lobby case, uh, if we look, uh, for example, at the Masterpiece Cake case, um, both of those cases have to do with sex. We don't like to talk about it. We don't like to think about it. But contraception happens to have to do with sex. And marriage, same-sex marriage, or domestic partnerships, happen to have to do with sex. Uh, when we were arguing, when we were planning the argument on the domestic partners law uh, uh, in Wisconsin, uh, I wanted, as part of our argument, to point out that uh, domestic partnerships weren't substantially similar to marriage because 
In Wisconsin, the only, uh, uh, everyone who's an adult can have sexual relations with any other consenting adult in private, if, as long as they're of age, except for one group of people, people who are married, because they are subject to the criminal law. You, if you commit adultery, it's still a felony in Wisconsin. I was persuaded not to make that argument. Uh, <laughs> And uh, part of the reason was, is because it was about sex. And so what I see happening is the dominant culture and the dominant religions uh, are troubled about that issue and troubled about the vast cultural changes that have arisen with regard to sexual behavior and sexual mores. And I, that's how I view the lens of what, I, I use that lens to look at these cases. So I just wanna put that out there for you as something to think about when, when, you, when you think about why, why was it that, that a sexual issue be, was, the, was fundamental in the Hobby Lobby case. Why is it that a sexual issue is fundamental in the Masterpiece Cake Theater? And uh, when you start to think about those things, you begin to, to understand how we use the courts and how the courts interact with cultural change um, and how you want the courts to interact with cultural change. Um, in 12 minutes, I can't really go into what I think about that in great specifics, but I want that to be a part of your thinking. You know, why are, why, why are cases coming up where people feel that they have to defend their religious beliefs? Why is it that a corporation now has religious beliefs? And in what context does that arise? Now what that leads me to worry about is this. Rick had that excellent quote that freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction, from Ronald Reagan. I usually don't quote Ronald Reagan, okay? Uh, he seemed like a nice guy, and uh, I liked the uh, bedtime for Bonzo, uh, but, He's right, he was right, absolutely right. The, the issue that I think that we face is, is this. Democracy is very, very fragile. <clears throat> the biggest enemy of democracy in the world today is theocracy. If we look at Iran, for example, which has a long and rich culture. That culture is suppressed by a theocratic regime. And we have to be, we have to guard against theocracy. We have to guard against a dominant religion taking over the making of public policy, not just through the legislature, but through the courts. Now, I'm not suggesting that that has occurred, but I am suggesting that it can occur because every single thing in constitutional law is subject to the final interpretation by the Supreme Court of the United States. And we, I think, as lawyers and as citizens, believe that the court will be careful and consistent and will follow precedent and so forth. But the danger is that when we start, we can start down a slippery slope with that court. I gave a, I gave a talk last year in Milwaukee and I pointed this was to the men's club of the Jewish um, uh, Community Center in Milwaukee and I said, you know, uh, Jewish people in America have had great, great protection. And primarily the protection has come from the First Amendment and the First Amendment 
through its incorporation through the 14th Amendment. And I said to them, that protection can go away if the Supreme Court of the United States interprets it away. And so I want us to be vigilant about that issue, to be careful as we think about issues of, of religious liberty and free speech. And, you know. Lester, one minute. OK. And, and the, the, where, where I come from that is intellectually is that we have to be vigilant in the protection of minorities. It's interesting, as Rick said, that people in Green Bay say they're afraid to speak their minds. Part of the reason that people are afraid to speak their minds is because they're afraid that people will speak back to them. And they, won't li they don't like what they hear. It's not a matter of suppression of speech. It's a matter of being uncomfortable with speaking because somebody else disagrees. But that's the essence of free speech. And to come back to what I started out talking about with the cultural changes that have occurred over the last 70 years, that there are more people who are speaking up than there ever have been before. There are more avenues for them to speak. And so the issues of free speech are more and more important. But the personal interactions with regard to spe free speech become more and more fraught. And we need to all think about that as we're approaching free speech and freedom of religion issues. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for those remarks. Uh, our final speaker uh, today is Jordan Lawrence, who serves as senior counsel with Alliance Defending Freedom, where he plays a key role with the advocacy research and innovation team. His work encompasses a broad range of litigation with a primary focus on religious liberty, freedom of speech, student privacy, conscious rights of creative professionals, and the First Amendment freedoms of public university students and professors. He has presented arguments on these topics in courts around the country, including in front of the US Supreme Court. Thank you for being here, Jordan. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, the, um, I'm, I'm from Minnesota. I grew up in Minnesota. I hope you won't hold that against me. Uh, and uh, why my one case that I argued at the Supreme Court was against the University of Wisconsin in the Southworth case uh, back in, uh, I argued it in 1999. And the guy sitting next to me was Associate Justice Dan Kelly, who was in private practice at that time, and uh, who gave me all the intellectual heft I needed to uh, argue that case. And you are very blessed to have such a great uh, mind uh, sitting on the highest court, and the, and the governor needs to be commended for appointing him there. So I just point that, give the shout out to Dan. Uh, the um, uh, so I uh, now live in the Washington D.C. area, and for the last seven years, I've been basically focusing on U.S. Supreme Court cases. And they've included, and, and so the way that, so sometimes you have a guy that argues a case, but you usually have this team of attorneys that are arguing the cases. And uh, ADF, Alliance of Any Freedom, we have had nine cases in the past seven years up there. We've had three in the last 11 months, including the, the uh, Masterpiece Cake Shop and the NIFLA case. And, uh, and I also worked on Hobby Lobby, and, uh, and I'm feeling like one of those uh, uh, Sherpa guides in Nepal that keep taking people up to the top of Mount Everest, which they do in May. If you, don't, that's the, the, uh, you go up to Mount Everest in May, it's right before the monsoon season. So this is appropriate that we're, we're talking about this. Um, with Lester, and, and maybe he can clarify when he's, I felt like I was agreeing with a lot of what he was saying if I define the religious minorities being oppressed by the predominant orthodoxy, the prevailing orthodoxy, as the conservative Catholics, Mormons, Christians, that are seeing the prevailing orthodoxy of more of a liberal secularism, a rejection of traditional sexual mores, 
trying to misuse the government power to oppress them. And I'm not quite sure if that's what he was saying or not. But if that's what he meant, I totally agree with him because that's exactly what's going on. And uh, the beauty of the First Amendment is that it protects minority points of views, that the, the, when the drafters of the First Amendment, the first Congress, I think had a basic understanding that when people get into government, there is this corrupting temptation to censor people you don't agree with and force people to basically pledge allegiance to the prevailing orthodoxy, kind of a Barnett-type way. And that's what we have both in the Cake Baker case and in the, uh, the NIFLA case on the abortion funding. It's the, the attempt of the prevailing orthodoxy to force its will on the dissenters who uh, uh, I think are dwindling in their popularity of their points of view. And, and it's, it's, I think, in no way the prevailing orthodoxy is kind of a 1950s sexuality. Uh, I wasn't going to speak about Hobby Lobby, but the, one of the things is, is that these kind of disputes didn't come up before Obamacare because there was no regulation, there was no government compulsion being put upon that. So in Hobby Lobby, uh, what we had was an Obamacare regulation that was done by a bunch of administrative, uh, in the administration, it wasn't part of the actual statute, that had at least three huge exemptions. They totally exempted churches as religious organizations. They exempted uh, any employer who had 50 or fewer employees from the, uh, the abortion pill mandate. And they also uh, exempted those who are grandfathered in. So for this compelling governmental interest of having women having access to contraception, the federal government on the Obama administration exempted tens of millions of women employees, which just showed that there was some problem with how this was going on. So I, I think that this shows more of, an, of trying to target those that don't agree and then especially after they went for uh, Little Sisters of the Poor a couple of years later, that just shows that this was not trying to make widespread uh, availability of contraception, which could have been done much easier in different ways rather than force dissenters to do it. And I think it shows this kind of thing that we're seeing in the Barnett case as getting everybody, the dissenters, to toe the line by speaking what the government says. Now, in the Masterpiece Cake Shop case, with a lot of these others, this is where, as we've seen Obergefell and the, and the legalization of same-sex marriage, that we've seen these come up in these contexts of these expressive businesses. So there are some businesses that produce uh, expression as the way they make their profit. Uh, Steven Spielberg's movie, the, the Post, shows that the Washington Post and the New York Times won their freedom of speech case with the Pentagon Papers uh, by saying this is a prior restraint under the First Amendment. The fact that they were a corporation didn't stop them. The fact that they were trying to earn money or earn a profit didn't stop them. The Supreme Court didn't say, if only you were a hippie newspaper handed out for free on the streets of Haight-Ashbury, then you'd have a First Amendment right. They didn't say that. They said it was protected be because of the nature of the expression. And you begin to think that there's a number of, of, of uh, occupations that what they do is they produce custom-made expression. Videographers, website designers, uh, people who ghostwrite books, uh, people who translate books, people who set up advertising campaigns, tattoo artists. And they can be asked that they, they, don't, they make custom products. And you can imagine somebody coming in and saying, I want you to des design a website or design a tattoo that, does, that's, that expresses this. And the, the, the person who creates it saying, I have a conscientious objection against this. So, you know, for example, if you had a, a vegan New Age website designer and the local Santeria church came in and said, will you design a website, you know, uh, emphasizing our rituals of sacrificing animals for our gods, you could see where the, the website designer might have a conscientious objection to that. And the answer would be 
why don't you find somebody else to design it, not let's take you down to the uh, Madison Human Rights Commission and sue you for religious discrimination. Same way, what if it was a veterans group that wanted a website celebrating their, their, uh, uh, their reunion for fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan? The website designer might have an objection to promoting the military, but that would not be discrimination by a public accommodation and veteran status. I mean, it might be technically, but I think that that's not the, resolve it, the way to resolve it. And to single out these kinds of people, uh, I, I just think is a misuse of the anti-discrimination laws as applied to those kinds of situations. Now, Jack Phillips is probably the only cake baker in all of Colorado that objects to making a same-sex, uh, a, a wedding cake for a designer, wedding cake for a same-sex wedding. Jack Phillips serves all people, but he does not create all expression. And uh, cakes express things. Uh, Walmart has been confronted with people wanting Confederate flag sheet cakes that they've said, well, we don't know if we can good conscience do that. And so cakes can communicate message. A wedding cake is a crucial prop used at uh, wedding receptions. It's not part of the wedding ceremony, but the couple walks in, they cut this multi-tiered cake, they feed each other, they, and people applaud and let the celebration begin. And it communicates, we are now legitimately married. And what this couple wanted was a cake, they wanted rainbow batter inside. They, now, they didn't tell that to Jack Phillips until after he said no to them, but they understood this communicative uh, part that the cake plays that they, they didn't want a pizza to cut, they didn't want a pot roast, they didn't want a birthday cake, they want a multi-tiered wedding cake that when it was cut had, had rainbow uh, batter to reveal that same-sex couples could be just as legitimately married. Now, up until Obergefell, these kind of cases didn't exist. So the extension of the government powers what created, just like in the Obamacare case with Hobby Lobby, created the conscience conflict, and that's why the First Amendment is there to resolve it. Uh, we argued that case back on December 5th. We'll probably get a decision uh, sometime before the end of the year. They got about 40 cases left for the next six and, uh, weeks or so to the end of the term. Now, we also argued the NIFLA case on March 20th. And this is an even more blatant example of government coercion of a prevailing orthodoxy to force in this kind of Pledge of Allegiance Barnett way the dissenters to assert the, the, the statements of the political orthodoxy. I'm just, now there's a lot I could say about that case, but let me just focus on the main part. The California legislature passed the California Reproductive Fact Act, and they basically gerrymandered this so that the legal requirement would only apply to about the 200 or so pro-life help centers that basically give their services for free to urge women not to have abortions. Some of them have medical licenses so they can do medical procedures. Uh, the, and usually the only medical procedure they did was ultrasound or pregnancy tests. So these were not signs that said, here are the inherent dangers of or risks involved in getting a pregnancy test or getting an ultrasound. They had this statement. This is what they had to post. California has public programs that provide immediate, free, or low-cost access to comprehensive family planning services, including all FDA-approved methods of contraception, prenatal care, and abortion for eligible women. To find out more, call this certain number. Now, they exempted all for-profit medical providers, all medical providers who did not see pregnant women as the primary point of their of their uh, medical practice, so that, that was just one of their secondary things, they were exempt from posting these signs, as well as they exempted any that signed up for another California program that basically required you to dispense abortifacient drugs. So guess who's in the remainder set? About 200 pro-life organizations. Then they, uh, if there was any advertising that these groups or the non-medical ones do, they had to put them in various languages. So even if you had the uh, Justice Sotomayor, so if they had pro-life as their advertisement, they would have to put disclaimers if they were not medically licensed in up to 13 languages, even if the original one wasn't in any of those languages, to basically make the advertising untenable. Now, one, California. One minute. 
California didn't advertise this uh, on the internet, the radio, TV. This was the only way that they communicated these messages. So to me, this is exactly the type of thing we were trying to, that the Supreme Court noted in West Virginia Barnett, that the First Amendment protects uh, the minority viewpoint from being crushed and silenced by the prevailing orthodoxy of sexual freedom for, uh, that we're having now. It was anti-Nazism or anti-communism. Now it's the, the, the orthodoxy of sexual freedom or to force them to say things that show their, that basically show them pledging allegiance to this new orthodoxy. And I hope the Supreme Court in both those cases by the end of June will carve out that protection of freedom and, and protect them. Thank you. Uh, th thank you so much, Jordan. Uh, now we're going to uh, give the panelists uh, an opportunity to re respond to what the other panelists said. Uh, maybe we can start with uh, Lester because um, Jordan specifically asked him a question uh, or, or an implication about what he had said, and then we can just kind of well, go. Well, I actually had a couple of questions because I, I was unclear about a couple of things that you said, and that is what was – my understanding of abortion pill is it's a combination of mis uh, – uh, mifepristone and misoprostol for medication abortions and I don't I was that the abortion pill mandate that you're talking about in the Hobby Lobby case is that what the drug you were talking about I thought there would be no science in this we would just be talking about constitutional law those are the I, I don't remember the exact drugs but they objected to those that those were ones that they would be required to dispense both Hobby Lobby and the Little Sisters of the Poor uh, there's obviously a uh, dispute over to whether those actually uh, create abortions, but this was their belief from the science that they based it on that it disrupted implantation, so therefore it was an abortifacient. Birth, I, I'm just curious about that. I, I, I just never heard about the abortion pill. I mean, the only abortion pill is that it's for medication abortion, so I wasn't sure what you were talking about. But the... the uh, uh, the, I interestingly, one of the things that uh, on, on this uh, the California case with regard to the uh, abortion, uh, excuse me, the pr crisis pregnancy centers, um, and this interacts with the question of whether or not the state uh, has a right to guard against fraud. Uh, and that's uh, then you have there, then, then th it presents a, a conflict you know, about, about speech and state regulation. So the question I think that's raised in that regulation, you argued it, I didn't. Uh, but I think that the an issue in those regulations is whether or not the, the, the uh, pregnancy centers were actually being fraudulent in inducing women to come in with the idea that they were getting something more comprehensive than they were. But that's, I'm just pointing that out to say that's a conflict. Okay, to characterize it as that there is a prevailing orthodoxy that's being imposed, I think is a bit hyperbolic. Uh, the, uh, the, the notion that uh, Christianity or conservative Christianity is under attack is uh, really hard to swallow. Uh, the, the, there, are certainly, there are certainly currents in the culture where people do not agree with the tenets of conservative Christianity. But when I drive from here to Green Bay and I drive through Winnebago County, I see gigantic churches that are brand new, that are evangelical churches. They don't seem to be suffering. Uh, and I think that the, that that, uh, that that that's a that, that that's the idea that the dominant religion in America is being oppressed is a frame which is not an accurate frame and which would lead to bad results in court cases if that is what the argument is based on. Uh, but I will I will agree that with the Obergefell case and laws which have been passed to protect uh, gay and lesbian people from discrimination, 
that it has caused conflict. Um, and and I, expect that, I expect that the court is going to resolve the Masterpiece Cake case in, in uh, favor of the cake maker. Uh, I fully expect that. Um, and uh, the question then is, is this. There were times when the cake maker wouldn't have made a cake for an interracial couple. Because the cake maker, perhaps, would have had sincerely held religious beliefs that, that people of different races should not marry. We would not accept that today. The Supreme Court in, uh, in Hobby Lobby suggested that, uh, that the decision in Hobby Lobby shouldn't be read at all to suggest that you could have that, ki that kind of <clears throat> distinction. Race distinction, you know, racial discrimination is off the table. It was off the table, but it was, that wasn't off the table 60 years ago. Some of those things were religiously based. And that's what, that is some of the objection to, or some of the support for segregation, some of the objection to desegregation, and certainly objection to interracial marriage was in part religiously based. And I'm just suggesting that, and, and that's what I was trying to talk about in my talk, was that these changes in culture create these conflicts in the law and that we have to be careful about what we do in these cases because we don't want religious freedom issues to then become the dominant way and the dominant frame in which we look at legal decisions and how that's going to affect people's behavior. Jordan, do you want to take a response to that? Yeah, uh, <laughs> there's so much there to say. I, you know, I hear this thing like, well, you know, I drive around and I see all these big churches and so therefore there must be religious liberty. Well, that's an undeniable fact that that's, but I think that that's sort of missing the point. So let me give you two examples. Yesterday, uh, Amazon announced that Alliance Defending Freedom could no longer be part of the Amazon Smiles program. So we were singled out as an organization, and they, they related it to the false statements by the Southern Poverty Law Center uh, that were a hate group, that sort of thing. Uh, so the fact that that coexists with the fact that there's these big churches on the way to here to Green Bay, and the fact that we haven't got to the status of North Korea yet doesn't mean that there's some cultural infringement on religious liberty. Now, here at the University of well, Wisconsin... They, maybe they don't like what you say, and they're a corporation. Right, okay. Right? And so the corporations then, now have the right to free speech. They can certainly do this and do that. Then let's talk and about the University of Wisconsin. Say, we don't right. like this guy. Okay, so the University of Wisconsin, we filed... Uh, Dan Kelly and I filed this lawsuit. They say they can require students to give the money out because they're going to they're going to dispense the money even handedly to groups. Then a few years later, the University of Wisconsin says, even though we're mandating students to pay the fee, we will not give money to religious groups who engage in religious worship. And so it was the Roman Catholic Foundation that became Badger Catholic was denied funding. And we had to have the Seventh Circuit reverse that. So there's, again, this kind of singling out the religious groups for treatment worse than everybody else with, with, with that type of going on. Now, Jack Phillips is facing real consequences uh, the, for violating the, the Clinic Act. Uh, it's, uh, they can be fined up to $200 a thing. Now, let me read the statement, too. If you think it's a neutral statement, California's public programs provide medium free or low-cost access to comprehensive family planning services, including all FDA-approved methods of contraception, prenatal care, and abortion. Most women in the, in the, the Medi-Cal program pays for the main way that women terminate their pregnancies, and that is by giving birth. And they don't even list it here in the thing. So they don't say, hey, do you realize the state would pay for you to, have, to give birth to your child? So this is an ideologically slanted statement 
that they're requiring these pro-life centers to say. And the Supreme Court pointed this out. And I would just say, if, if, if this is just delusional, that all these Christians and pro-lifers are suffering persecution and we, it, it, we're just in some sort of Fox News echo chamber or something like that, then why is the Supreme Court giving such credence to what we're saying? I mean, Justice Kennedy, I mean, even Sotomayor and Ginsburg were saying this seems like a little much in this case. So I feel like the reality, I would just urge you to see that there's the, the, those that control the main parts of the culture that are the voices there, there may be a lot more numbers that, you know, go and elect Trump and, you know, Wisconsin goes red instead of blue, you know, that kind of thing. But the people that control the, 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 the opinion makers, the people with the megaphone certainly are not espousing conservative Christian pro-life views in this society. Professor, you Can I jump in here a little? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, a few of the things in, in this past exchange uh, that, that Mr. Lawrence has said uh, struck me as almost bizarre, honestly. Um, um, uh, although I, I, I understand reasoning. I'm not sure about the constitutional significance of the people who hold the megaphones. I'm just not sure that the Constitution provides a remedy for a culture. Uh, uh, and that there's a culture, a constitutional requirement to adjust the culture in some way. That's a very broad observation. I'm just not sure what to do with it. It just strikes me as, as confusing. Uh, but let me go back to the Masterpiece case, not in terms of this discussion that these two gentlemen are having about, is there a war against Christmas? Uh, I have to confess. I mean, I've yet to meet a non-Christian who finds the suggestion that conservative Christians are oppressed minorities anything other than a joke. Uh, it's, it's a victimization that exists that is only recognizable uh, by members of the self-proclaimed group, which may or may not be interesting, but it's at least suggestive of something. But let me go back to this particular case, not in terms of that debate, but in terms of what I was talking about earlier about categories, right? In order to make these arguments work, we have to abandon uh, some of our previously existing First Amendment categories. And maybe that's a good thing, but we should recognize that we are abandoning them. So for example, uh, in 1965, there was Piggy Park. Uh, Piggy Park was a barbecue shop uh, whose owner said that serving black and white customers together sent the message that he approved of race mixing. And that violated his rights against compelled speech and his religious objections. In 1965, the Supreme Court dismissed that, basically left it out of court. I believe the phrase was, this is not a serious argument. Today, apparently it is. Uh, in fact, one of the lawyers, uh, I don't know if it was Mr. Lawrence or someone else, uh, when confronted with a question about race uh, discrimination at, at, in the Supreme Court argument, said, well, that might be a unique case. Well, perhaps so. That might be a debate. I mean, there might be a reason to argue that race is unique and all other forms of discri discrimination are different, but it would be a new approach. It would be a new argument, a different argument. Traditionally, in the case of expressive conduct, we've said that expressive conduct occurs only when a neutral observer would plausibly associate the expression with the person who, who performed the conduct. And so by that traditional measure, we would ask, is seeing a cake at a wedding, if you see a, this cake at a wedding, would you say, aha, that baker approves of same-sex marriage? It's an empirical fact question to be decided at trial, but traditionally, that would be one of the tests. If we're abandoning that test, we may. Uh, we may say that expressive conduct is the same as speech in the context of compelled expression. Um, and abandon that, that old distinction between attributable expressive conduct and non-attributable expressive conduct, but it's new. And that's just interesting, and of course it raises new conundra and new questions. In or, right? um, so, so my only point is not that it's obviously wrong, but it is obviously, but it is much more radical than we seem to be giving credit to uh, in, in the debates that we're having. And as always, when we make radical changes in the intellectual vocabulary that we employ to ask certain categories of question, we should think about the consequences that that will lead to beyond just the question before us. Uh, being driven by the facts of an individual case is almost never, uh, what was it? hard cases make bad law, as, as the fellow once said, and he was pretty smart. Professor Essenberg? Yeah, yeah, a couple of things. Um, um, first of all, um, Lester asked why these people in Green Bay uh, would think that they are uh, not free to speak and suggested it's because they're afraid that someone will speak back to them. Now, I, I would note, and uh, without further comment, that many of the people who attended this event 
uh, uh, that we held in D Green Bay with David French and who felt uh, that they would be um, subject to unacceptable sanction if they spoke freely um, actually came from Madison. Um, your, now, and having and having your, and your point is, um, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> uh, um, the problem is, Lester asked, well, why would these people think that they have to defend their religious expression? And the pro and, and the reason is that they are the ones who are facing coercion. That is, you know. I, I don't subscribe to the notion that, you know, that, that Christianity is under some wholesale attack. But there are certain elements of the Christian community um, who are essentially being told that uh, your point of view um, reads you out of polite society in some way. And the reason that these cases are coming down the way they are, high on Hobby Lobby, uh, in the California case, in the Masterpiece Baker case, it's not that these folks who have brought these cases are attempting to impose their views on others. They're not. They're the ones who are attempting to defend themselves against imposition or restriction of their ability to express their views. So, you know, the, the Democrats are fond of saying, and the progressive left is fond of saying, that we represent the coalition of the ascendant, and maybe that will turn out to be true. I don't think history has any arc, um, I, uh, but, 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 but if it is true, uh, then there ought not to be any reason uh, to um, help history along through legal coercion. Now, when we talk about uh, the impact of the culture, and Professor Schreiber says, well, we can't do anything about the culture. I, I, there's no constitutional right to change the culture. And, and, and I agree with that, but I think there is a constitutional right to be able to stand against it. In 1942, the culture said that we must all unify, we must all pledge allegiance to the flag because right. we face an existential enemy. But yet, but yet, the United States Supreme Court carved out a space for the exercise of freedom of conscience, even in the face of that type of threat. There will always be a reason to suppress freedom of speech. There will always be a reason to suppress freedom of conscience. Popular speech, popular manifestations of conscience, they don't need protection. Nobody will ever attempt to do anything for them. This only gets hard, and this only gets to be a principle that we have to stand for when there's conflict. And when, uh, it, you know, it, there's the famous saying that, you know, I will defend, and I, I disagree with what you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. Well, we say that, we, had, we, we, we express our agreement with that, but then we find it hard to cash out. We find it hard to live up to that in practice. And uh, what the Supreme Court did in Barnett is it, is it held us to that standard. It said, this is what we believe and we're gonna, and, and we're gonna stick to it. Um, I think the notion that, um, that baking a cake um, is not expressive conduct because someone else will not believe that you expressed yourself is not consistent uh, with our constitutional jurisprudence. And it's not consistent with a common understanding of, uh, of, of what expression means. You know, in the, in, the, uh, uh, in the Trump inaugural, there were a lot of dress designers that said that they wouldn't dress Ivanka Trump. Right. Uh, because they thought, because they understood what they were doing to be creative expression. And you know what? I think they had an absolute right. They had an absolute right to say, to refuse to do that. It's absolutely true that Amazon can refuse to allow into their Smiles program anyone they want. Uh, as a matter of legal doctrine, we don't apply First Amendment principles against private corporations, and I don't think we should unless they, uh, they promise to abide by them, but I think that, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, 
<laughs> but I do think, <laughs> but I do think it's important, if not as a matter of law, but as a matter of civil peace, that we, that we recognize that although we have the right to boycott people, although we, Google has the right to fire people that write memos expressing opinions <clears throat> that they don't like, Google ought not do that. That we, ought to, that we ought to actually have a culture of tolerance, and we also have a culture in which we're able to interact with people with which we disagree, even when what they say is something that we strenuously uh, disagree with. In all of these conversations, uh, you know, there's always sort of the loving versus Virginia card is played. And, uh, uh, but, but the problem here, I think, is that the fact that you can find some similarity between two things doesn't mean that they are, in fact, similar. Uh, I, I think that, uh, I, I mean, first of all, I do believe How that do race. How Piggy Park? I do believe that race is. It was an expression. It was service, I, although you put in that he would be expressing. He, he, Piggy he Park argued, was, he, he said, the act of serving black people was, was against his religious belief. That's right. And I think Jack Phillips, for example, I defended the New Mexico photographer. They serve all people. There's nothing expressive about serving barbecue. And I think to conflate that, well, I think the example, if I can just interject, is the Hurley... St. Patrick's Day sure. parade case in 1995. You kind of gloss over that, where they they viewed mm -hmm. the the Massachusetts authority and the state supreme court found it to be a public the parade put on by a veterans group to be a public accommodation, and they said, but because their product was essentially expressive, it was compelled speech to use their anti discrimination law to force them to include a message they would not otherwise do voluntarily. So this is, that's over 20 years old. I think we're relying on cases like that. And uh, and th that to me is exactly the kind of argument we're making in the Jack Phillips case, not some sort of uh, concocted new legal theory. That, that's well, fine, but if you, if you want to make that argument, recognize that Hurley depended entirely on the claim that the message would be ascribed to the parade organization. No, it did not. That is clearly not the case. And I would point out to the Supreme Court said, the fact that people would know it wasn't their message does not exonerate them from the First Amendment compelled speech violation. And they pointed to uh, Tornillo and Woolley versus Maynard Tornillo. to point out that that was the case. So I just think... With all due respect, Professor, I think you're just wrong on that point of law that if people can't attribute it to you, you're off the hook. Nobody thinks that a New Hampshire license plate is the message of the car driver or that somebody responding under the Florida law is the opinion of the Miami Herald. So the fact that it, you can't attribute it, it is not exonerate these kinds of situations. You know, my concern is that the uh, expressive speech concept is going to expand. And that's the danger. If you're right about the cake maker, OK, and you may be right, because the Supreme Court decides what's right and what's wrong. That's why they're called the Supreme Court. There's no appeal from there. You may be right. Then the next expressive, the, the next expressive uh, speech is the hairdresser who does a certain hairstyle and the nail salon that does a certain nail or the tailor who makes a certain suit or the car detailer who puts a certain detail and there's a you know there's a slippery slope here <coughs> toward the concept of using expressive speech to discriminate against a minority that you don't like. Can, can I? Can so, I, I mean, that's, that's a danger. Uh, gentlemen, can, can, we're, we're, at our, we're at our stop point, and I think, you know, um, <laughs> while people are, I'm sure, loving this conversation, people love to eat lunch, so we're going to have to give Lester the last word on that. Well, what, even, even though we're at the time? Okay. I've been given I've been given privileges by Lisa to do a couple of questions. So uh, please make your way up to the microphone. I'm just starting the microphone. <laughs>
Yeah, when, you, when you're taking the pictures, you know, that's uh, expressive. Since we have no it questions. It is, that's what we argued that. in the New Mexico that's photographer right. case. If, if you could. Okay. Come with the microphone. Well, yeah, I'm, go ahead. I think Rick, Rick should Rick should be allowed to have the last word. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Um, can, could could you could you like call this. my wife afterwards and tell her that? Um, <laughs> the the um, so so here's the thing. We always hear the slippery slope argument, but I do not believe that we live life on a slip and slide. Um, um, you know, it, it's an argument that itself is the ultimate slippery slope because there's there, there's no stopping point to it. And here's the thing uh, that I would point out. Um, you know, Howard mentioned, uh, you know, and I, and I actually think that, that his, the points he made about the way in which our uh, 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 religion clause uh, jurisprudence has changed is, is, uh, is, is a very good one. Uh, but, uh, you know, in Employment Division versus Smith, the United States Supreme Court refused to um, apply uh, you know, strict scrutiny to all laws which burden religious practice. And I think part of the reason, and particularly if you look at the academic commentary on it, uh, the, the, the problem here, and it's a real problem, is that religion is limited only by the human imagination and that anybody can claim that anything is an exercise of their religious practice. But, here, but, but in Wisconsin, we don't follow Employment Division versus Smith. In interpreting Article One, Section 18 of the Wisconsin Constitution, uh, we say, yeah, if there's, a, if there's a substantial burden on religious practice, that has to be justified by strict scrutiny. And that decision is now um, almost 25 years old. And we have not been inundated with uh, claims that um, religion justifies all manners of exemption from secular regulation. It simply hasn't happened. Can I ask you a question? Yes. Do you make a distinction between religious practice and sincerely held religious belief? If, well, I, 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 if I, do I make a distinction between religious practice and sincerely held religious belief? If the point that you're trying to make is uh, under what circumstances can a court evaluate whether a religious belief is sincerely held, then no, we're no, getting no, into a whole that, we're, we're getting into a whole other you know that's not question my, that's that we not, can't possibly discuss before lunch. That's not my question. My question is the references to a case which said we apply strict scrutiny to the interference with a, with a religious practice. And what I'm asking is, does that mean the same thing as a, since does religious practice mean the same thing as a religious belief? Well, a religious practice is typically practice. predicated upon a religious belief. In the Smith, in the, in the, in the case, the, the case that, in which the Wisconsin Supreme Court announced that it would not follow Miller, we had, a, a religious practice. We had the uh, the Amish saying that um, they did not uh, that their religion prohibited them from having you know one of those orange slow moving vehicle signs on the back of their buggies, and uh, and so uh, they claimed the right to be exempt from that. I would call that a religious practice based upon a religious belief. Well, I don't remember enough about the Amish to know precisely. Uh, uh, what the religious belief they had, which allowed them to, or which which caused them not to have that belief, it was something about gaudy symbols or something like promoting that. promoting pride. Right. right. I just want to comment that I agree with. I think every single thing that Rick just said, which is not does not always happen, and that's a great way to end. A, uh, <laughs> <laughs> right.